you know. If you make a peace agreement, usually it is determined that it is a, an agreement that there will never be another war. How many of those have been made? And people always forget what our Father says in his word. They will cry, peace, peace, peace. But there shall be no peace. As long as we have Satan as the prince of, our, uh, as prince of the air in this world age, there will be controversy and there will be war. And you must always, as a Christian, think and know and realize there are two wars. There's a spiritual war and there is a flesh war. And many might say, as it is written, and one of the reasons you want to always keep up, uh, in Mark chapter 13, verse 7, what does it say? It says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, the time is not yet, but these things must uh, come to pass. So what you have to be careful of is when the spiritual war and the physical war join hands and all wars become a religious war so, or a spiritual war, so to speak then you're getting very close to a time you want to be very watchful because there can be rumors of war and wars but at the same time they're talking a whole lot of peace but when you have one religion that thinks cutting somebody's head off is the right thing to do for Sunday school and a group that truly teaches their children in Sunday school, how to be, to do your neighbor as you would want to be done yourself. We got something wrong, okay? Something bad wrong. I mean, you know, there's something missing up here as far as world peace goes. So with that thought, Christians, when, when Christianity was first founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, probably they wouldn't think about going to war because there were so few of them in the beginning but they fought the spiritual war from day one Satan was on their case and you know something he hasn't changed but since that time Christians have had to war now you will have that ilk that will say well God never believed in war God is love and when God is love, we're supposed to love everybody. Now, I've got, a, I've got just a little bit of advice for them. You're supposed to love everybody. Well, it, it would be nice if you could, but these people want to cut your head off in love. So there's something wrong. I mean, two and two doesn't make four in that way. But two and two do make four when you face the truth and know they're our enemy. And we're at war with them. Would God participate in war? Open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. We're going to pick it up about verse 27. And we're going to analyze with, you know, the Syrians at this time, we were at war with them. Our people were. And they said, you know, they thumped our gourd good, the Syrians did, but their God is the God of the mountains. He's not of the valleys or the plain. And if we'll trap them out in the valleys of, or the plain, we can thump their gourd big time. So they get their armies all together, and I'm just set in the field. What is God going to do about this? They, I mean, his people are pretty small down there compared to the Syrians. Verse 27 of 1 Kings chapter 20. Would God be a man of war? 27 reads, And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present, I mean the whole bunch, and went against them, Assyria. And the children of Israel pitched before them like, like uh, two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians filled the country. I mean, they were, they were like little children down there by themselves. They were so few of them. And the Syrians, I mean, they were mobs. Numbers and numbers. It would look just almost impossible. 
What would God do? Verse 28. And there came a man of God. Who was this man from? The man was from God. And spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I'm going to thump their gourds for you. So, well, is God a man of war? Of course he is. I mean, what kind of father would he be if he didn't protect his children? And many might say, well, I don't see any love in that, then you're ignorant. If you've never seen a mother protect her child and see what real love really is, then you haven't lived. You're living in a dream world somewhere. Naturally, God lets the love pour forth when he protects his children that are in the right instead of somebody running around beheading people. That's love. That's real love in a real world. Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. Our father is a father that is not a dream. He's a real father. And he believes in protecting his own. But I thought we were supposed to do to our neighbor as we would want to be done ourselves. You are. But when you do him the way you want to be done and he wants to slip up behind you and cut your head off, you got a problem. He's not your neighbor. Okay? You got that? If somebody is trying to cut your head off, he is my friend, not your neighbor, and you had better be on guard. That's why we have war, is to protect our young, to protect our nation, to protect our children so they're not faced with such things as that. Do you know something? Your Heavenly Father feels the same way. He wants to protect His children. So that's what He looks down, and man, I mean, the whole house of Israel is like two little flocks of lambs, helpless as can be. What, how, how, how can a lamb or a sheep protect themselves? By the shepherd. And God is their shepherd, just as Christ is our shepherd in, in, with God with us, Emmanuel. And that, my friend, is real love. So uh, don't, you know, you're living in the end days. There's going to be war. And you've got to understand that war because it is one of the signs of the coming of the Lord. As long as you hear of wars and rumors of wars, it is not yet. These things must be, must be, not maybe. They must be. But the end is not yet. Well, you want to be real careful. Because at any moment, under stress, as the world system is now, you know, uh, the UN, and this is not a political thing, this is stating facts of what's happening now. The UN is under a great deal of stress. You know, there are some people think there's even a bunch of crooks in there. You know, that they made off with some money or something. Did they? Well, where did it go? I don't know. I know we didn't get it. So, uh, and, and then you've got one elk that would like to turn everything over to the UN. They even want to come and count your vote. Now, well, I'm not even going to go there because my Irish gets disturbed when I think about the United Nations counting votes in America. That just... That could be a whole nother lecture for a whole nother time. And probably I'd give it out behind the barn. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Now, um, but God delivered them into their hand. 29. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined. That spiritual completeness. Got it? And the children of Israel slew of the Syrians an hundred thousand footmen in one day. It wasn't supposed to be. But God gave them into their hand. Look at God still in it. You think God won't take vengeance. Vengeance belongeth to God. But the rest fled to Apex, that's into the city. That's a city meaning strength. 
And there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. He ought to hide. I mean, he should have known then that our God is not just a God of the mountains and the hills, but he's also a God of the plain and the valley. And he is not afraid to fight. He's not afraid to war when war is necessary. And, you know, uh, again, what a beautiful nation we have that we are able to protect most of our families by conquering our enemy in his own nest. And that has changed a little bit. But not too much. We're still, as long as you're on guard and you're not out trying to buy any used camels, well, you'll do fine. You know, you'll be safe, all right? Okay, now, um, I just wanted to touch on that to show and get it right off the base. God deals in war as well as peace, all right? And that in itself is love. Now, go with me to uh, Luke chapter 14, New Testament, Luke chapter 14, and uh, Luke chapter 14, I want to pick it up with verse... Uh, Thirty-one. This is Christ's teachings, understand? He has just said, he's just finished saying, you need to love me better than, more than you love your own family even. Why? Because he is the head of your family. He's the closest relative you've got. And uh, then he continues telling you how to protect yourself and your family against the agents of Satan that roam this world. Verse 31, he gives you an example. How sharp are you? Or, he says, what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether to be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else... While the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. In other words, if you can't whip them, you better try to work something out. But if God is with you, you can whip them. You don't have to worry about it. Okay. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, that doesn't mean anything monetarily. It means you've got to put God first in your life, okay? If you're going to be a student of Almighty God, if you're going to be a student of the Word of God, which is Christ, you've got to put Him first, okay? That's where your faith must be. Find to love your family. You know, a lot of people get real nervous about this because of the mistranslation back in... Um, Back in uh, verse 26 where it says, And if any man come to me and hate not father and mother and wife and children. A mistranslation is love less. Okay? God wouldn't want you to hate your family. They're precious to you. You're supposed to love them. They're, they will always be with you. And um, if it is a, a, a common, normal family. Uh, but you have to put him first if you're going to be his disciple. Okay? Verse 34. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? In other words, if it's not salty, you can use all of it you want to. And it's not going to change the flavor. You're not going to be satisfied. Yuck. Okay. Verse 35. It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He says, what I want you to do, if you have ears to hear spiritually, 
Understand what I'm talking about. Put Christ first in your life. Put Almighty God first in your life. In other words, His Word brings you everything. His Word brings you riches. To be rich with God's blessings is, is one of the greatest blessings in the world. You don't have to apologize for being rich if it's with God's blessings. It's ill-gotten gains that you want to worry about. They'll always keep you looking over your shoulder. Have they caught me yet? They will. Okay. But to be rich with God's blessings is beautiful. But listen to me. Satan wants you. We're at war. We're at spiritual war. And you better sit down. And you had better plan ahead for the battle. He's gonna, he knows your weaknesses. He knows what you love more than anything in the world. And he knows how to put you out on the rack and tighten the, the spiritual uh, straps to really put the pressure on you. But where's your faith? Where's your, have you put Christ first? Have you put God first? And said, help me. But plan ahead. You're at war. Well, I, I just drift along from one day to the next and hope for the best. Well, you poor soul. Poor, poor soul. What, what a life you're going to have. You, look, Satan sets traps for you. Be ready for him. Slam him in his face. You have power over him. Wouldn't you be kind of an idiot if you put up with it? Christ, this same teacher that has taught us here, saying, put me first. Why? Why should you put him first? He has given you power over Satan himself. He has given you power over all of your enemies. Why wouldn't you put him first? What do you have to be afraid of? Nothing. As long as you use wisdom and knowledge of God and put him first, but you plan your life. Some's got to say, well, I've got to have a little example. Well, I, I like to use the little example of a husband and wife. Here, it's time to do our teeth. And this, we're, one's going to squeeze the tube. Get a little toothpaste on there. And the old man does, and he brushes his teeth, and he lays the tube down, and there the miserable-looking thing lays you know, squeezed in the middle. And along she comes and she says, ah, Why don't you roll it from the bottom? You are the dumbest critter I think God ever allowed. I don't know why I picked you for a mate. Satan's got them going. See, they're at war and they don't know it. And Satan's winning over a tube of toothpaste. I mean, the great Christians... I mean, heroes for God. And they're fighting over a tube of toothpaste. Boy, if Satan can get them for that, how many other things can he get you for? You know? Well, I just don't like the way you're doing that. Uh, I think I could do it better. Well, honey, have to it. <laughs> you know, that's the way to go. Uh, that's all right. If it's too heavy for you, you make two trips, sweetheart. Okay. <laughs> you know, get along, whatever it takes. Okay. Now, I hope you see my point. Satan wants you because you're a child of God. And the war is ahead of us, my friend. It hasn't really gotten started yet. I mean, it's going to get rough before it's over with, with the spurious Messiah. And you better have the armor of God on and in place. And you better have planned ahead. And you better have gotten the wrinkles out of the toothpaste and out of your life to where, hey, it's going pretty smooth here, where when things really get rough, you can count on each other. You can anyway. But I use that example to say, you've got a plan. You leave, you leave one little crack in your armor. And Satan's going to spot it. And he's going to pry right into your life. And you're going to wonder why things fell apart on you so quick or why you got so upset. You let Satan in. 
He wants to, you know, if you ever have trouble with that, go read the book of Job all over, especially the first two or three chapters. I mean, Job was a man of God. He did everything just right, and God had blessed him. And Satan says, if you just let me have him, you've got that armor around him so bad, and he knows you've given him that power. But if you'll just take that away and let me get to him, I can own him just like that. And man, God, and God was proud of Job. And he took that defense down, just like he could take it away from you, and then you'd be without it. God help us if that ever happens. Because I like ordering Satan out of my life. I like uh, ordering Satan out of people's lives that come here. I like to order Satan and sicknesses out of people. In Christ's name, of course. That's good authority. But you get stripped of God hearing you and just letting Satan wallow you all but take your life like he did Job. Poor old Job was so full of sores and so down and lost all of his children, all of his property, and his wife said, why don't you curse God and curl up and die? Good woman. <laughs> but he got a better when her God straightened her out, one or the other, okay? And anyway, uh, don't, I mean, I want you to plan ahead. That's why you're a Christian. You're at war. You plan ahead what it's going to take spiritually. You understand I'm speaking spiritually here, okay? Don't let Satan woolly you around. Don't lose the spiritual war and gain the other, being a part of this great blessed nation. God scattered his people and then gathered them again, as he promised, in the end times and made them a fine people. You know, I could, I could pull out a dollar bill if they'd give me one, but I don't have one. So anyway, it says, in God we trust, you know. I do have, I'm teasing, okay. But you know, you know as well as I do that it's there. This what a blessed nation we have. So much going our way. Don't lose it. Don't, I, I, we're not going to lose the nation, but I don't want you to lose to Satan in your private life. Don't let it happen. Okay, you're the winner. You got the biggest hammer of love. Don't be afraid to use it. That may sound counter to some people, but beloved, we live in those times. God will take care of what you can't, but he expects you to take care of what you can. So you plan ahead and you watch and get those clinks that Satan might try to use, just get them out. Don't have time for it. And serve God. Okay, so you see, here in Luke 14, Christ is pleading with us. We're at war. He said, if you'll just be a little bit salty, where you make a difference, when you walk in a room, people know you're there for the good, and it changes the flavor where they can see and understand the communication of the living word and can communicate with him to receive that power, that instruction, and that blessing from God. Okay? That's what he wants you to do. So don't, don't just get by spiritually. Don't be just a get-by Christian. Be salty. Make a difference. And God will love you for it. God will bless you for it. Okay? Um, and, and, you know, some might say, well, all of us are not old combat Marines like you that have been through the fire and tested and you know how to take out whatever it is that needs to be taken out. So that doesn't have anything to do with it. I mean, the littlest, smallest of the flock, as long as the shepherd's taking care of it, that's where you've got to be strong, is spiritually. That really counts. Don't you ever feel weak when you've got him. That's why you put him first, so that you feel that power. Dunamis, all right? That's what the word is, power, in the Greek. Dynamite, that's where it comes from. And 
if you think I'm telling you to be arrogant, you're missing the whole mark. A lot of people might consider it arrogance tough for them. When somebody is sure of themselves on their footing that God is with them, many people take that as arrogance. Never apologize for God's word. But use it the way Christ would want you to lose, use it, and you can never, never go wrong. Plan ahead. We're at war. You're a general. Act like it. Plan and make sure that if someone, some little bad thing happens in your life, take care of business. Straighten it out. Don't let it like an old canker fester and fester and fester until all of a sudden, pow, it explodes. Take care of business in his name. Put him first. Okay, now where are we going to go from here? Do you all know? <laughs> Some of you probably do. We're going to Revelation chapter 12. I got some good news and I got some bad news as far as these wars go. We have war on earth, but beloved, we've also got war in heaven. And I still don't understand why some people will say, well, God's not a man of war. Well, um, he sure does a lot of fighting for us, for somebody to call him that. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to, how much time do I have here? I have all the time I want to take, but it's like they say to me, when, when does your flight leave? I said, when I get there. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so we'll... Uh, that did sound arrogant, didn't it? The, it's, the Irish has a way. You know, you can't trust them. About the time you think things are going just smooth, the Irish kicks up and you just got to get in there and zing. Once. It's called keeping people awake. <laughs> okay, mainly, all right? Not that anybody's asleep. I'll never forget one time when the church... I'm digressing, I'll admit it, but it's fun, all right? Down when the church was in the old building down here, I said, I, it was part of the sermon of, wake that man up right there. And I looked over where I pointed, and the old boy that sprayed our, poisoned our buildings for bugs came all the way from Springdale. He was sitting there snoring like, <laughs> I mean, he was happy, you know, and content. And of all things, I would end up pointing right at him, you know, and everybody looked, and I felt my stature went, shh, like, <laughs> <laughs> like the, oh mercy. Anyway, back to the subject. War, there's war in heaven. And, and I mean right now, I'm talking about heaven, this earth age. We're going to take this further than that. Before we're over, I'm going to show you there's war at the end of the millennium. We're not through with it. As long as, don't you ever kid yourself, as long as Satan has not been turned to ashes from within, as God has already sentenced him in Ezekiel 28, 18, and 19. There's going to be war. Okay? You can count on it. Don't ever, don't ever go to sleep and kid yourself. Let's go back to the first earth age. That's what this 12th chapter starts out with. It covers more ground physically, time-wise than any other chapter in the Bible, basically. And there appeared a great one, 12 one. Revelation, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. We're in heaven, okay? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, meaning pointing toward Mother Israel, okay? And she being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. This was Satan's downfall in the first earth age. You understand? I mean, we're going all the way back to there. If you think this is the same as the little, his little description in, in Revelation 13, you're mistaken. It doesn't jive, okay? This is way back. And his tail, this is to show you there was war there. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born, meaning uh, Mother Israel. As soon as well, he, in the first earth age, Satan drew a third of God's children. 
to the Lord, I mean to himself, and away from the Lord. And you know, if you need documentation to prove that the stars of heaven are ch the children of God, read um, Job chapter 38, where it says the children of God, the stars of heaven, rejoiced at that time, and it'll document that for you, okay? Uh, bless your hearts, listen. There was trouble back then when Satan rebelled. And you know something? Did God want to hear? God could have destroyed Satan right then. He did pass the sentence on him, as I, I quoted earlier from Ezekiel 28, 18, and 19. Why didn't he just go ahead and kill a third of his children and not have to mess with this earth age? I don't know. How would you like to kill a third of your children? Sobering thought. What? Why? You love them. So does he. So instead, he destroyed that first earth age where we go out and document with ancient history that it existed, that it was here, just as the Bible states it is, and gave them the opportunity, rather than to kill them there, gave them the opportunity to love him or Satan. It's your choice. You're born innocent of woman like a little lamb. And in life, you know, you, you write your own sentence on Judgment Day. You don't have, you might say, well, these people misled me. No, no, they didn't. You listened. They're, hey, you want to be careful who you listen to. You want to check them out. You check this man out or any other man you listen to. Check them out in the Word of God, like I've always instructed you. Because you, you are the one on judgment days that's going to say, nobody else, just you and God. And you're going to decide by your actions whether you go down to that place, that big old lake of fire, or whether, which is the second death of the soul, or whether, whether you're in paradise. It's up to you. So anyway, that was what I, back to the subject, and perhaps some may say I digress, be that as it may. But there was war in the first earth age. That's what I wanted you to know. It's called, in the Greek, the katabo. You with the, you with the companion Bibles, your appendix 146 goes into the foundations of the world. And you should study it if you're not familiar with it. There's about to be another war in heaven, and it's the one you need to really be planning about. We pick it up in verse 7 of this 12th chapter. And there was war in heaven. <gasps> Do tell. There it is again. War in heaven. Some of these peaceniks that run off to avoid war live in a dream world. Okay? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Who do you think won? If, Satan, if, God, if Christ gives you power over Satan, what do you think about Michael the archangel? Do you think he doesn't have power over him? Come on. Eight. And prevail not. So Satan lost. Neither was there place found any more in heaven. You want to make note of that. They couldn't find a place in heaven for Satan anymore. But let me tell you something. That's bad news for you on earth. Because if there's not room for him in heaven, and now, now his evil spirit can roam the earth, he's coming in person, my friend. Michael's the one that does it. Got him right on the toe of his boot. Boots him and all his angels, the Nephilim, out uh, uh, Napha from the Hebrew, the fallen ones, angels. Going to have the biggest revival you've ever seen in your life in this world. And you know something that's going to have more people join it than you can shake a stick at? The whole world's going to whore after the Antichrist and his revival. And the great dragon was cast out. Now, now God wants you to be real sharp. Who's the dragon? He's the fake king, okay? That old serpent. Who is the serpent? The serpent is the, the deceiver, the seducer. Call, it, call the devil... That's the wicked one. And Satan, the adversary to everything you do. Do you see that, God? Do you see what that little buddy of yours just got through doing? 
Do you see? You see your little reverend, your little revolving rev over there. You see what he's doing there, God. Look where he went. Look what she's doing. I mean, he's up there accusing, finding fault with everything God's children, his elect Christians, are doing, which deceiveth the whole world. I mean, I mean, this is gigantic, my friend. Those that are not learned are going to be deceived. He was cast out into the earth, make no guesswork, and his angels were cast out with him, the whole herd. Do you think they're coming to destroy? You're sure mistaken. If you don't, they're coming to have a revival. Come unto me, all ye that are... This is why Jesus said, there's going to be a lot of them come in my name. Beware. Just before the, the verse that I quoted earlier about wars and rumors of wars. And he continues on in that same Mark 13, and he doesn't say maybe the Antichrist will come. He said, he will. And when he's kicked out and they tell you he's in the desert, don't go. Because you're going to be delivered up and you're not to premeditate what you say before him, but you will speak that that is given you in that hour. What hour? The hour of temptation. The hour that many people will be tempted to worship and follow him, this supernatural entity. But we do not find him tempting. We find him rather to be an abomination. Still serving the true Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to certainly use you as it is recorded in that same chapter. No, he's coming, my friend. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the, king to the, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. There's going to be a little season that that accusing is not going to be up there. You know why? It's going to be down here. Okay, I mean, right next door, little church next door. And they overcame, and I'm not knocking churches, I want to make that real clear. Churches that are taught fantastic stand against him. And they overcame him, how did they do that? By the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. What is the word of their testimony? It's the word of God. And they love not their lives unto the death. Who, do you know who death is? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Christ came to this earth to be crucified, to die on the cross, whereby he could destroy the devil, which is to say death. Okay? You're going to be delivered up before death. You're going to shake in your boots? Or are you going to be ready to let the Holy Spirit witness through you so that it carries to the whole world? Your witness keeps you alive with strength. But the main thing is not you, but the whole world that hears. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Do you know how short? Five months. Revelation 9 documents it even tells you what time of the year it is, most likely, May through September, the time of the locust. But don't get cornered and deceived. It doesn't promise that's when it'll be. It said like that. Okay? If he comes in the middle of the winter, out of harvest, don't go. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Christianity. He persecutes them. Why? He wants them to change their religion. Only, it's not really change their religion. He wants them to change messiahs. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half time from the face of the serpent. That's the original three and a half years, which is half of the seven-year seven period of the 70th week of Daniel. Don't let me snow you now. That's quite simple. 
But it has been, Christ would say in Mark 13, seem like I'm going back there a lot today. But he said, for the elect's sake, because the false Messiah is so strong, for the elect's sake, I shorten the time, or there would be no flesh saved. And that time was shortened to five months, as it is written in that um, uh, ninth chapter of Revelation. And the serpent cast out of, a, out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. You know what that flood is. It's lies. The same lies he said to Eve. It won't hurt. Surely, in the day that you eat thereof shall your eyes be opened. Do you know that's part of the word atosh in the Hebrew, which means seduced? To the backbone, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the, the backbone, the body, and the limbs. And she bit, she took it. And don't worry, Adam follows right along. See that you don't. You, you follow the second Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, which is Christ. And you stay perfect. You plan ahead. You're going to war. Are you prepared? This is, what, what am I saying you should do? Your mindset in Christ, that you're going to follow him. You're going to follow the word of God. You're going to be strong with him. The flood of lies does not bother the woman. Do you know what God said in, in Revelation 9, 4? He told Satan, I'm, you're going down there, but don't you dare touch mine anointed, those that have the seal of God in their forehead. You can't. What is the seal of God in your forehead? This truth, this word, because this word lets you know that Satan is coming first, and there is no way he can touch you because you find him to be an abomination, not tempting. Do you know what his message is going to be? I've come to save the world. I'm, I'm not instead of Christ. He would never say that. But do you know what instead of in the Greek? I'm sorry, anti. Do you know what anti means in the Greek? I just told you. Instead of. Okay. Instead of Jesus, the faith. And he's going to be acting like Jesus. Revival after revival. And people are going to be going zonkers. Worshiping God. Only it's not God, unfortunately. See that you're not taken in. War on earth, we can cut it. Why? We put Christ first, the true Christ. Verse 16, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. God always takes care of his own. You don't... I don't want you sweating. Don't worry. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Naturally he is. That's why you've got to be prepared, my friend. Don't let him in. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Boy, does he want to make war with you. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not the fake, but the true testimony. The testimony of Almighty God leading, directing, guiding protecting you, protecting your family. Satan wants in real bad. And the closer we come to that day, the more he wants in. I, I've got some more news for you. We're talking about war. You know that Revelation chapter 20 has to do with the millennium age, where there's some teaching going on. Do you know what happens at the end of the millennium? we got war again. And praise be to God, it's the last one. It's the final war. Revelation chapter 20. This has to do with the thousand year period, and a thousand years is a millennium. Or, as it is written in Second John, Second Peter chapter 3, be not ignorant of this one thing, that with God a thousand years is as one day with man. So this thousand years is the Lord's day. You got it? And at the end of the Lord's day, this thousand year period, this is what happens. Verse 8. 
I'm sorry, let's take verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, they're over, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Don't turn him loose again. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as sand of the sea. Isn't it amazing that there's still that many that won't believe at the end of the millennium? Think about that. They're in spiritual bodies. And they still don't believe. And sometimes you wonder why somebody can't receive the truth. Now, think about then. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, where the fire of God, the consuming fire, destroys the element. Stanchion in the Greek, which means that that is evil, not that that is good. The Holy Spirit warms us, but it destroys the rudiments. The evil, they're gone, done, finished. Never to be again. Praise God. It's going to happen. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, which they were cast in before the millennium, meaning he will never have the power to deceive his antichrist or his one world political system at the end of the millennium and were tormented day and night forever and ever, meaning he turned to ashes from within, as Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19 declare. And I saw a, a, a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, not the evil. It was the full Godhead's presence. De jure, not de facto. De facto is to take something by force. De jure is it's all his. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand, some of them spiritually dead. Do you understand it? Those that are spiritually dead before the millennium will be spiritually dead until God allows them to take part in the second resurrection, if they are worthy. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works, not faith, works. You know, we live in an interesting time. You are blessed. Many of the prophets even more than live now. You're witnessing it. You're living while it's happening. How exciting. When you look at the Middle East, when you see prophecy, when you see the old land of Abraham, Ur, which is now Iraq. And you see the old city of Babylon, 50, what is it, 57 miles south of Baghdad, on the, the river there. All these things transpiring before our very eyes, and some people don't even realize what's happening. Sign after sign after sign. War after war. Well, it's, it's a war because of politics. Oh? What kind of politics is this that, uh, for religious reasons, they cut heads off? Yeah, I could say you might try one particular branch. This has nothing to do with Islam, the true study of, of Islam. But the sect that uses religion to war with. We're at that time, and you're living in it. May God bless all of us. We're going to need it. But you know what? It's like a walk in the park when you got Jesus. It is his word, his word, that carries us through. You know, I, I, um, I'm going to take time to go one more place. Uh, Revelation chapter 19. I, I want to turn there. It just popped into my mind, and I guess that means the Holy Spirit wants us to cover it. Chapter 19, the great book of Revelation, second advent, verse 11, and it reads, And I saw heaven opened, and before behold a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He makes war at the second advent. Got it? 
His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. You know what that name is. Do you know why he's got many crowns? Because he's king of kings, and there are no other. All crowns f flow to him. And he was clothed with a vester dipped in blood, and his name, here's his name, his name is called the Word of God. And that Word of God is the seal that you must have in your mind. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Do you know what that flying linen is made up from? We would have read it a few verses before this. Those people's righteous acts. I don't know how much yarn do you have or do you not have any yarn there that maybe you would have a teeny bikini. You know, you want to think about it. Again, uh, 19, 7, and 8. The righteous clothing that you wear is woven from your righteous acts. You don't have any, you won't be wearing anything in heaven if you make it. So, war, yes. Why? God loves his children. Satan wants to win. We're not going to let him. You might say, well, God's going to take care of that himself. Don't, don't, don't be awkward. Why do you think he has you? Why, why do you think that he created you? What, do you know what he created you for? Have you ever read Revelation chapter 4? The last verse? All things God created for his pleasure. And do you, do you know how you pleasure him? What did Christ say? I come to bring not flowers, but I come to bring fire. And if I find it already kindled and fanned, how pleased I will be. Are you fanning it? That's his word. That's his name. Think about it. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father. What a privilege and a pleasure to be able to serve you, Father. Be with us this day. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Why would you want to let him? That's what I don't understand. Uh, you know, people do. But put a stop to it. Throw him out. Anoint your home. Keep the good spirit in your home and in your life. So, uh, no, Michael, you know... Uh, you got to be real careful. A lot of people almost do angel worship. And angel worship is a sin. There's only one Father, and He doesn't want you to put anyone before Him or around Him. So don't ever forget that. Okay. Now, uh, but Michael is the guardian angel. He is the angel of Israel. He's the angel of God's children. But there's only one Savior, and that's Emmanuel, God with us. Michael is not God, never has been, and never will be. Be very careful where you tread. Never tread where few fools go. It gets pretty deep. Pat from Ohio. Is it written in the Bible about being able to teach a family member in the millennium? Yes, it is. Uh, it's written that you can help them and teach them, witness to them. Uh, and um, I suppose it would be like as if, as God's elect, you are with the Father and the Son. But you still are aware of what your relatives, mother, brother, father, sister, unmarried, is doing. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 25. And you can go and apparently say, get your act together or you're going to hell. You can see what has happened going on here. Now, get it straight. But then you have to pay a penalty of staying away from the throne for seven days for having done that because you touch the spiritual dead. That doesn't mean death like you think of death today. It means they're still spiritually dead in a hammer, and they will be until the second resurrection. Maybe they'll take part in it. That's what you're striving for, is to see that they do. If they don't take part in the second resurrection, and they've already missed the first, Elizabeth from, and, and I'm not judging anybody. We don't have that right. People judge themselves. Elizabeth from Oklahoma. Who are the Indians? I hear Indian people say they are one of the lost tribes. Is this correct? Who are the ethnos? Thank you for your time. Ethnos is, uh, is a, um, 
Greek word, and it means nations, okay, or people of the nations. When you see ethnos or nations plural, it cannot apply except in one place to Israel. It always means the ethnic people, and that's where our term ethnic comes from, ethnos. Um, and um, to judge all Indians as uh, one, you would be in incorrect, for there are the Uchi, which um, is the king line, and, um, and here I'm running out, I am out of time. And um, so don't judge people. I'll just leave it like that because i got to go. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, okay? And most of all, God loves you for it. That's why he wrote the letter to you, is to keep you out of trouble and to document to you he does love you, okay? So make sure he can read your mind. You don't even have to say it out loud. Let him know you love him. And we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, but most important, this. You stay in his word. Every day in his word. Make just a little time and, let it, and stay in that word every day. And it's a good day, even with trouble. Know why? Jesus is the living word.